Hello everybody and welcome to worship on this day or on this night, wherever you are, whoever you are, you are welcome here. So for those of us who are in Melbourne, we are about halfway through, but we know that the numbers are not looking good, not all is tracking as it should. And the days are like mountains over which we climb and time stretches. But today, and all days, Jesus breaks bread and tells us, be fed. Stay strong, though the weeks are long, and I will watch with you. I will dance with you. I will wait with you and dream in these wastelands with you. And together, but only together, will we find our way through. Let us worship our God. We gather together to worship on the land of the Wurundjeri people. As we gather, we acknowledge that the wattle, the cockatoo, and this band in the Burrurung River was taken without consent or negotiation. We give our respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and we pledge ourselves to work alongside these First Peoples to achieve a just future for all. So John has just come over with some bags of food which he and his beautiful wife are dropping off for the commission flats for the food program and never one to miss an opportunity I decided I would grab him and get him to share with us the story of the feeding of the 5,000. He's taken off his mask, he's bearing his face to the wind <laughs> and his teeth and away he goes. Now when Jesus heard this he withdrew himself in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and feed themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. These are the words of faith. These are the words of hope. Thanks be. To God. Thank you so much to John for saying yes to me filming him in the garden and to Olwen for collecting all that beautiful food which um, was part of our food drop this morning. So in the children's talk today I thought we would go on a little adventure because um, the story is all about Jesus feeding 5,000 people um, sort of out of nowhere and our friend Anna, who sometimes comes and does beautiful clowning and play with us here in this community, she's participating at the moment. She's been volunteering since the beginning of the pandemic in um, a food program at the base of the Commission Flats. And our community has been collecting food. And so Tilly and I went off this morning to um, be part of the feeding of the 5,000. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go down to the peace of the wild things. I go down to where the wood drake lies and the great heron feeds. Hey beautiful ones, everyone is hungry right now. We're hungry for food and connection and community and everyone is wondering what they can do to help. 
And some of us can donate, and some of us can advocate, and some of us can go down to the flats to be part of joy. Tilly and I went and hung out with Anna earlier this week, and we took all the food that everyone had given us, and we asked Anna, what is it that you're doing here? And who are you feeding? And where is your joy, our beautiful one? <laughs> so Anna, how long have you been volunteering here? Uh, probably about two and a half months, maybe three months. Yeah. Yes. And what inspired you to come down in the first place? Uh, um, so this couple of neighborhood houses, the Collingwood neighborhood house and Belgium Avenue neighborhood house are um, a amazing uh, bunch of folk. I've been working with them for about in the city of Yarra for about seven years doing different projects and so when I heard that they had the food bank and looking for volunteers I was like yes because I got to see a bunch of folk that I hadn't seen in ages and also yeah help out. And what's one of the most inspiring things that you've seen while you've been doing this work? Uh, I think there's, there's a real sense of community. They had beautiful, actually over there they planted um, a couple of trees and they were wishing trees. Uh, and so the community got to write down the things that they wished for. Uh, and then they planted them. They've got really good community gardens here. Um, and it's a lovely, yeah, it's, they're really good grassroots neighbourhood houses here who connect to the local community. Yeah. And one last question, Anna. Where are you finding your sense of play in this time of lockdown? I'm, I'm crocheting. I've learnt to crochet. I, normally I'd be wearing one that I made, but um, I had to wash them. So I'm enjoying that. And uh, also, yeah, a bit of, bit of study, a bit of reading, thinking a bit about how my arts practice can not translate online, but can translate in different ways. Thank you, my love. And with my housemates who are fabulous and, and very playful and yeah, that's a lot of fun too. So kids, this is what I want you to do. I want you, every time your mum or your dad or the people that love you go down to the shops to buy some food, I want you to say, hey, could you get a little bag of rice or could you get a little bottle of oil? Or could you get some tuna? Because tuna, even though I'm a vegetarian, it's actually really popular down at the flats and it's filled with protein. Or maybe you could get some salt or some coffee or some tea or some honey or some oats. Something that's gonna fill a belly and help people to feel warm. Jesus fed the 5,000 with what he had and we can do the same. Dear, insert name here, all my power to you in this dark time. Firstly, I wanted to say how I have deep confidence in, insert name here, and the staff. And I am very grateful to your ongoing care. I am trying to assess whether dad would be safer in or out of care right now. I am wondering if you could share with me the statistics on how many of your staff are working across other sites. I myself am still out in the world doing my ministry, I'm going out shopping, etc. so my home is not a bubble. I am wondering if we did bring dad home, would this eat into his social leave? And what impact would it have on the treatment on his return, as in needing to be isolated for two weeks, etc.? Thank you for helping me discern the right way forward for him. All my blessings, Alex. This is the time of loaves and fishes. This is the time of loaves and fishes. So it's early in the morning and the sun is yet to rise and I'm talking to my girls about the trade union movement. We're talking about the trade union movement because we are talking about the way that Dan Andrews was just saying, I cannot stand here and tell you that I have confidence in the staff and management across a number of private sector aged care facilities. I cannot tell you that I have the confidence that they are able to provide the care that is appropriate to keep their residents safe. And that 
I wouldn't leave my mum there. And that we don't run this sector. And we were talking about why, as the Moreland Socialist Alliance councillor Sue Bolton said, the casualisation of aged care staff is one of the reasons that the spread of COVID-19 has happened in so many facilities. And we were talking about how the unions began. And it was because people realised that if they got together to share what they had and to lobby for their right to safe working conditions and for the freedom from harassment and for decent pay, then they were much stronger as a body, as a collective, than if they stood on their own. Clyde's bonny banks, as I sadly did wander amidst the pit heaps, as the evening drew nigh, I spied a young woman, all dressed in deep mourning, a weepan and wailing with many a sigh. Stepped up beside her And thus I addressed her Pray tell me the cause of your trouble and pain Of the and wailing At last she made answer Johnny Murphy, kind star Was my true lover's name I grew up on songs about mining disasters and union movements and English invasions of the Scots. I grew up knowing that we are stronger together as a truth. This truth, the power of the collective, is far more ancient though than any trade union movement. It is written into our stories. It is written into our rituals and it is written into our biology. As botanist and member of the citizen Potawatomi nation, Robin Wall Kimnar writes in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, the plants and the animals are our oldest teachers and the trees act not as individuals, but somehow as a collective. And what we see in this is the power of unity. What happens to one of us happens to us all. We can starve together or we can feast together. And this is why part of our national prayer are the words never take the first, never take the last, take 
only what you need. Take only that which is given. Never take more than half. Leave some for others. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Use it respectfully. Never waste what you have taken. Share. Give thanks for what you have been given. Give a gift in reciprocity for what you have taken. Sustain the ones who sustained you. And the earth will last forever. Such a prayer comes from an understanding that everything, everything comes from God as a gift. And that everything is to be shared. And then God said, behold, I have given you every seed bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit it will contain. They will be yours for food and to every beast of the earth and every bird of the air and every creature that crawls upon the earth. Everything that has the breath of life in it. I have given every green plant for food. In today's reading, Jesus feeds the people. He feeds the people first with stories, stories rich with, with metaphor and hope and radical restructure, stories about our God who is with them in their poverty and in their fear. And then, well, then he feeds them food. In the words of the theologian Nancy Rockwell, these were a hungry people. And their hunger, this went deep down into the bones of them. And their stomachs growled. And the pervasive sense of not enough, of scarcity and of grimness, it was everywhere. And the disciples, they saw it and they felt it and they could feel the beginnings of danger. You don't want to mess with a hungry people. And they urged Jesus to send them away, send them away so that they can get some food for the hour is late. And these people, they are hungry. The pervasive sense of not enough. The pervasive sense of not enough, of, of, um, of scarcity and of grimness, of not enough staff maybe, or not enough gear, or not enough trust, or not enough communication. I've been ringing and ringing about my mum for days, and they said that she was just sitting in a chair. They said that she was fine, and then I got a phone call from a hospital, and she was dying. Not enough hours, not enough work, not enough collective bargaining, not enough questioning of how our culture works and not enough history lessons. I was talking to my girls about the trade union movement. I was talking to them about how we're stronger when we come together as one and not enough reflecting on when did we give this away? When did we give our hard-won solidarity away? And when did we buy into the neoliberal myth birthed by Reagan and Thatcher in the heyday of the death of society that there is not enough to go around? But Jesus said to them, there is no need to send them away. You give them something to eat. And they replied, we have nothing. We've got nothing. We've got five loaves and, and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And he took the bread and he took the fish and he broke it. And he gave thanks and nobody on that day went hungry. Or in other words, 
Jesus, the Jesus who knew that the presence of God is rife with abundance and teeming with fruitfulness, said to his friends, don't send them away. They don't need to go anywhere. Bring what we have and offer it to them, for we have everything we need here. We always have had. There is an abundance. We simply have to reach within and extend beyond and do what needs to be done. The Australian Council of Trade Unions has long been lobbying for a universal right to paid pandemic leave. They've been lobbying for this since April. And according to Councillor Bolton, it's recently been made public that administrators of many privately run aged care homes were refusing to let aged care staff use personal protective equipment. Apparently it cost too much to buy. Bolton, among many others, has been arguing that aged care employers should give their staff permanent employment with fair pay so that these workers don't have to move around a number of homes seeking enough shifts to just be able to pay their bills. And as reported in The Age last week, the deregulation of Australia's aged care sector and the relentless cost cutting has made this crisis in Victoria's aged care setting utterly predictable. Now, Jesus was pretty clear about sharing the common wealth. He was pretty clear about working together and about what matters. Leave everything, he said, and follow me. Do not store up for yourselves the treasures on the earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Freely you have received. Freely you must give. And this woman, this woman has done a beautiful thing. Indian writer and activist Arundhati Roy points out that this pandemic represents a rupture in the fabric of our society like no other. And it is likely to act as a portal between one world and the next. We have to choose. We have to choose what sort of world it is that we want to create out of the wreckage of this devastation. And that part of this choosing will be informed not just by our politics, but by our theology. Do we want a system that cares for the least of these? Or do we want a system where the beggar sits at the gate? Do we want a system where the worker scrambles to make ends meet, racing from one gig economy job to another? Do we want a system of privatised care for our elderly, where the market provides and the market decides what it can get away with? Is that what we want? Or do we want a system where we are all invested with our money and with our hearts, with our common wealth? Jesus said, don't send them away. We have everything we need here. And we always have had Dear, insert name here, thanks so much for getting back to me so promptly. It's great to hear that your staff are permanent and about all the measures that you have in place to keep your residents 
and the staff safe. I will watch and wait and see how this week unfolds. Thank you for helping me look after my dad. Blessings, Alex. Who would you valency? Let them come hither. This one will constant be come winter weather. And no discouragement. you and love you Fairfield. So one of our beautiful community members Emily works in the disability sector which as you can imagine in this time of lockdown has been profoundly affected and those amongst us who are most vulnerable have been um, at high risk for many of them in terms of care that's available and resources and community around them. I invited Emily to share with us a prayer today about her experience and her work. She's never written a prayer before and this is her offering for us to enter into today. Thanks, Emily. My role at work is to ensure that quality supports are in place for children and young adults with complex disabilities. Prior to March 2020, my job focused on supporting these people with complex disability to reach their goals and access their chosen community, whether that was through employment, volunteer work, education, training or social groups. Each person's day was individualised based on their own interests. Since COVID, my job has changed dramatically. I'm now working to ensure that some of the most vulnerable people in our community get through this pandemic alive. During the last five months, I've also noticed that I'm now spending many hours of my day counselling and supporting the parents, the parents who are working tirelessly to ensure the safety and health of their loved ones. I thought that I'd share a few stories before we say our prayer today. A single mum living in lockdown with her 10 kids. Five of them have complex mental health or disability. In lockdown, emotions and tensions within the family are running high. No one can get the space and quiet that they need. The kids are hurting each other, fighting over their mother's limited attention. Schools expect the mum to try and homeschool her kids, but her days are spent trying to coordinate the many supports coming in and out of the home, whilst also ensuring that everyone um, is safe. If the virus enters the home, even DHHS doesn't really know what will happen to such a large family. The mum just needs a break. A son with complex challenging behaviours. He has an obsession with knives and lighting fires. He's constantly threatening his mum and his siblings. Police come and go from the home, child protection cases open and close. He's passed from one caseworker to the next. His behaviour is communicating something and even with a team of dedicated therapists and support staff, no one has yet been able to consistently give him what he needs. All the while, his family are in lockdown now, living in fear for their own safety, yet not wanting to say goodbye to their kid. A mum and dad who are determined to keep their adult son 
in, out of institutionalised care. He has multiple severe physical disabilities. He cannot eat, drink, toilet, shower, move or talk independently. He needs 24-7 supervision due to the severity of his self-injurious behaviour. His parents are scared that a large team of support workers coming in and out of the home every day will bring the virus with them. A woman with intellectual disability, previously supported by a team of support workers six days a week to get out into the community. She used to access volunteer work and socialise with friends six days a week. Now she's locked in a group home with strangers who she doesn't like. She's unable to see her family or usual support workers due to stage three restrictions. Her house is closed to the outside world. She doesn't understand the lockdown and repeats, mummy, daddy, all day. But sadly, her mum and dad can't care for her. A 28-year-old with severe OCD. She can't walk two steps forward without repeating what she just did ten times, again and again and again. The support staff in the home no longer have access to regular behaviour therapists that used to come and visit her. This leaves staff vulnerable and unsure of how to support her. Her behaviours are increasing every day without the regular visits from her therapy team. And throughout all this, I see the parents. The parents who are fighting for funding and supports which the NDIS makes as difficult as possible. The parents who schedule their days so precisely for the house and themselves to look as presentable as possible for when support workers arrive. The parents who ensure that their child and young person receives the therapy and medication they need. The parents who wake up three hour, every three hours at night to turn their young person so that they don't get bed sores. The parents who sleep under weighted blankets due to their anxiety about their young person hurting them in their sleep. So today I'd like to play, pray for the people with complex disability, their parents, and I'd also like to pray for the staff supporting them. To the people who don't understand, to the people who can't stop their compulsions, to those who are angry and hurt, to those who are alone in homes and confused, to those who have a fully functioning brain but their body doesn't cooperate, please know that I see you, I love you and I really miss you. I pray for the parents who, whose strength every day astounds me. I cannot imagine your pain right now. I pray that you can take each day as it comes. I pray that you know that this lockdown will end. I hope you can know that you aren't alone. I hope you can find the energy to keep going, even after no sleep, and to continue to love the person who causes you so much pain and anxiety. I hope that even in this time, you give yourself space to grieve and space to sit with your own sadness. And for the staff supporting these families, I pray that we can have the patience and understanding that we need. I pray that we don't stop loving, even when we become the punching bag for anger and frustration. I pray that we can find quietness and calm in our own lives outside of work to prevent our own burnout. I pray that we don't give up and that we continue to hold each other's hands and pull each other through this crisis and that one day we can all look back and say, we did it. We got through that nightmare together. Amen. Our blessing today comes to us from the writer, the poet, the extraordinary storyteller, Padraig Otuma. And it goes like this. God of darkness. You must be the God of darkness because if you are not, then who else can we turn to? Turn to us now. Turn to us. Turn your face to us because it is dark in here. And we are in need, your people, we are in need. I mean, we can barely remember our own truth, and if you too have forgotten, then we are without hope or a map. So turn to us now. Turn in to us. Turn your face to us, because you turn towards us in the dark and in the beautiful body of your incarnation. You turned 
towards us. Amen.